I don't know if when I do that, if you guys can hear me or not. So I don't want to do that. Um, if you are having any issues, please someone send me a text and let me know what it sounds like. Uh, but I'm going to move forward and just turn my volume down. It's not to confuse myself. So today we're going to have a conversation about COVID-19. I know that, of course, this is a topic that's very important to everyone. Um, it is a pandemic that we're all experiencing currently. Um, if you are in Jersey City, then you know that we have testing sites. One second, someone told me to close the Facebook Live, but I'm not sure how that works. And this is my first webinar, so bear with me a second while we get set up, because I want to make sure that this uh, broadcast is good and that everybody's getting the information that they need. Okay, now I'm back to the Zoom. One second. And it still says live on Facebook. Okay, I think we're good now. <laughs> so if we are not, then Lorenzo, send me another text message. But I believe we are good now. I am looking at it on my other laptop. So once again, Councilwoman Denise Ridley, we're here to discuss COVID-19. Thank you to everybody that's joining in. Um, we know that COVID-19 is a big deal here in Jersey City and throughout the world right now. So I wanted to make sure that you had an opportunity to hear from some doctors um, that are dealing with this COVID-19 situation every day. I also wanted to take some time to address um, the issue of COVID-19 in the African-American community. I know that uh, that has been a concern recently, especially um, on a broader scale with the recent statements that were made by the Surgeon General publicly, which I think was great um, that he did do that publicly um, to bring awareness to the situation. So I know that that's a hot topic at the moment. And we have some experts here today that are more than able, willing and eager to uh, discuss that topic and that uh, are ready to share their insight with you. So Let's just hop right into it. First, let me just do a few housekeeping things. If you are in Jersey City, please be aware that we do have two testing sites. I think that most people know that by now because they've been running for weeks at this point. There is a testing site um, at the old DPW facility, Department of Public Works on Route 440. That is a drive up site. Then there is also a, a walk up site that has been on Marin Boulevard across from Newport Center Mall. That site uh, has now rotated to the Bethune Center. That site is at the Bethune Center today. But you must call and make an appointment. If you scroll through my Facebook page, you will see the flyer. I will repost it again just to make sure you have all the information. But we do have two testing locations for Jersey City residents. You must be a Jersey City resident. And please know that if you need any information at the state level, there is information on the state's website, nj.gov. As soon as you go there, there's banners for COVID-19. If you need any information from the city, as soon as you pull up the city's website, there's a, a separate tab for COVID-19. All the information is there. If you have any questions, feel free to send me an email, dritley at jcnj.org, dritley at jcnj.org. My office is up and running. We're working every day, so feel free to reach out. Okay, so... Let's get into it. So I have a great panel for you today, and I'm going to ask each of them to take a few minutes to introduce themselves, and I'll just run through their names very quickly, and then we'll circle back to the top. So we have Dr. Ebony Hilton. We have uh, Dr. Rashonda Mitchell. We have uh, Dr. Essien. 
I said it right this time. <laughs> we have Dr. Bell, and we also have uh, Reginald Swift. So we're going to start with uh, Dr. Hilton, and then we'll move on. And I'm going to ask each of them to take about 30 seconds and give us a brief bio. Dr. Hilton. Hi, I thank you for that, Congresswoman Ridley. Um, so my name is Ebony Jade Hilton. I'm a critical care anesthesiologist, which means I do 30% in the ICU and the remainder of time in the operating room and the medical director of Gustav Consulting. So thank you for having us. Thank you. Dr. Mitchell. Hi, my name is um, Dr. Rashonda Mitchell. I am, um, I, I guess I finished in obstetrics and gynecology. So that's what I do as far as my specialty. And then I decided to specialize further and do high risk obst obstetrics. So I deal with um, maternal fetal medicine, which are complicated pregnancies. So. Awesome. Dr. Essien. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Utibe Essien. I'm an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, I'm a primary care trained physician and a health disparities researcher here at the university. Nice. Dr. Bell. Everyone, uh, nice to be with you all. My name is Tyson Bell. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Virginia where I practice critical care, infectious disease, I'm also the medical director of the ICU, one of the investigators on a clinical trial for a COVID treatment, um, and co-founder and, and a co-CEO of Alpeak Labs, a diagnostic imaging company. Awesome. And Mr. Swift. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Reginald Swift, founder and CEO of Rubits Life Sciences. We are a, uh, a health research organization that is focusing between product innovation and uh, effective patient outcomes with, with a lot of data and innovation in between. Awesome. And I thank all of you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to uh, be here with us today and to share your knowledge and insight. So our first question, and I'll just throw this out there for whoever wants to jump in, um, is can you explain why COVID-19 is a new virus, but coronavirus is not new? I know when this first started, you would see pe people p post pictures of the Lysol bottle and say, you know, they're saying coronavirus is new. This is not new. It's right here on the Lysol bottle. Can you explain why we're saying this is new, but we have seen uh, the word coronavirus before? Sure. So I can take this one. Um, and uh, uh, but first, let's just talk about what are the coronaviruses. So this is a family of viruses that infect both humans and animals. And when we're talking about the coronavirus now, uh, what we're talking about is the, the new coronavirus that's causing the disease called COVID-19. Um, so after this explanation, when we just say coronavirus, we'll be talking about the SARS-CoV-2 virus that's causing the disease now. Uh, but this is a large family of, the, of viruses. There are seven that have been known to cause disease in humans. Four of them are just causes of the common cold and all their names um, look like license plates. So there's no need to, to name them, um, but they're the ones that cause uh, just the, the uh, stuffy nose, sniffles. They cause more of a nuisance than a problem. And they cause about one out of uh, five cases of the common cold every winter. So those are four. And then three of them are ones that have caused severe disease. So two examples. Um, before COVID-19 were SARS in 2002 to 2004 that broke out in, um, in the Wuhan province of China, about 100 miles um, north of Wuhan. That infected around 8,000 people, um, 700 or so lost their lives. And then in 2012, the MERS virus, which is another coronavirus, 2,000 people infected, 600 died. And uh, now the COVID-19 virus, which has um, so far affected around 2.3 million people, uh, with 160,000 losing their lives, including 78,000 cases in New Jersey and 3,800 uh, uh, 3, deaths. So it's a large family of viruses, but um, what we're talking about now is the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is uh, the disease that causes COVID-19. Um, another question that always comes up is, um, you know, since we're familiar with influenza, um, you know, how is this similar and how is it different than the influenza virus? Um, so it is different. There are some similarities, but influenza is a different virus that causes infection and it infects maybe one to two out of 10 people in the United States every year and causes between 20,000 and 60,000 deaths. Um, it is spread in a similar fashion to uh, the coronavirus, mostly droplets and hand to mouth or eye or more nose contamination. 
and it causes a lower respiratory tract infection. So uh, what's called the pneumonia, which can lead to a more severe disease. And the symptoms can be fairly similar, um, cough, fever, shortness of breath, muscle aches, sometimes a headache. There's a little bit of a difference in that the coronavirus has been causing people to lose sense of taste and smell, uh, which isn't um, common with the flu. Uh, but as far as that goes, the similarities uh, disappear. And this is a different virus. Um, first of all, it's deadlier than the flu. Um, the flu is estimated to cause uh, a death in one out of every 1,000 people, whereas uh, this, uh, the numbers kind of move and it's not certain, but we think it's around one in 100. Uh, so about 10 times more deadly than the flu. In addition, also spreads easier than the flu. So the flu, on average, if you have an infection, you will spread it to 1.3 people. And there's no such thing as 0.3 of a person, but what that means is that you have 100 people that have the infection with the flu, they will then pass it on to 130 people. So then you'll have 230 people infected. Uh, with the coronavirus, this number is one to every two and a half and sometimes even up to four people. So we're talking about 100 people that can then spread it to 250 people or even up to 400 people, depending on the conditions. So you can see how it can spread so much more rapidly. It's 10 times more deadly. And this is why it's causing such a strain on the healthcare system. And you see these cases go up so quickly and cause a lot of disease at the same time. So um, it is a, a different virus. And in addition, um, the influenza has a treatment um, that we can give and it has a vaccine. And we have trials that are going on, one of them at the University of Virginia. Um, and we have um, a vaccine that we're trying to develop, but we don't have those yet. So there are some key differences between the coronavirus and influenza. Awesome, thank you very much. That was great because you actually I was going to ask that question too, the difference between the two. So you covered both of those for us very, very well. Um, question about the virus being airborne. Now, if the virus isn't airborne, can you explain why social distancing is so important? Dr. Yassian, you want to take that one? <laughs> I'd love to. I mean, I'm trying to learn from Dr. Bell as well as I did all throughout residency when he was my chief resident, but I'm happy to, <laughs> to take this one on. Um, so the data are still, and evidence rather, are really pointed strongly to um, the new coronavirus being transmitted through droplet, um, which is by a cough, by a sneeze. That's why social distancing rules are out there, and specifically at six feet. That's about as far as these larger, heavier droplets can go. Um, that being said, there's still some data right now that are pointing towards the possibility that this virus might be airborne. There are um, studies out of China, studies out of Italy, et cetera, that um, having up to as many as 25% of cases being airborne. Again, I'll let Dr. Bell kind of specify some of those details, but because the data are still growing and because of the concern for um, spread by droplets, again, by cough or by sneezing, but also by speaking, whenever we speak every now and then there are some um, droplets that can get out into the air. That's why social distancing is so critically important. Um, the other point and factor, and I think we might get um, into these, this later on, is that um, as we do a cough, as we do a sneeze, we cough into our hands, we cough into our shoulders, our elbows, et cetera, we then touch the doorknob, we then touch the, the windows, the panels, the cell phone, and everything else around us, um, again, increasing our risk of potentially being exposed to the virus. So while it's not it's less likely that the virus is airborne. There's still a possibility that that is the case. Um, and the ability to stay away from droplet, whether it's a cough again, the sneeze or speaking, um, is really the big reason why we're re recommending that folks stay six feet from each other um, in social distance as is being described. Right. And I think it's important to note also is that um, what a, a lot of this we don't know. Just say it frankly. This is a novel virus, meaning that, and what does novel mean? So coronavirus, you know, Dr. Bell did a great job at explaining um, the medical end of what we, how we kind of describe it. But for layman's term, I always use that coronavirus is like your last name. Many people have the last name Hilton. We have different strains, different family lines that have different characteristics of each. Still have the same last name, different characteristics. Same thing with the coronavirus. With this virus, though, the body, no one's body has ever seen this strain of um, coronavirus. And so 
we are learning new things about the way that it's transmitted. We're learning new things about how long it stays active um, on surfaces. We're learning the way, um, new things about how to treat it. And so we're making recommendations based on what we know for now. And so the best practice that we, we um, say is to stay as far away as possible. Six feet is a random number. It's not like we have this randomized controlled trial that says it's six feet better than 10 feet, better than four feet. We're saying just stay as far away as possible um, from someone so you can prevent the risk of contaminating yourself inadvertently. So, Great, great. And along those lines with the virus living on surfaces, because in the age of social media, you know, we have a lot of things floating around. So we have, you know, it lives for three hours on this. It lives, you know, 24 hours on that. Don't don't pick up your Amazon package until 24 hours later. Leave it outside. Like, I disinfect everything that comes into my house. I might actually uh, end up sick from having bleach or Lysol in my food. But, <laughs> you know, I try to wipe everything down uh, because I don't know. And I don't know what's on the surface when I get a delivery. So I, I spray the outside of the package with Lysol before I open it. I let it sit in the sun for a little while. Do we have any idea or roundabout numbers how long this virus stays on certain surfaces? Or is that all kind of just uh, speculation? Well, we have rough ideas, right? We say roughly for cardboard, 24 hours. We say roughly for plastic and stainless steel, about three day, 72 hours, right? The, the question is, how much of a viral load is actually still present on those surfaces? And that's going to vary based on if this was a package that was left outside, right, versus in a contained space. So on, on average, what we say is that if there's anything that's been handled, um, just to keep it as simple as possible for everyone that's watching on Facebook, if it's been handled by an outside entity, if you got it from the grocery store, if someone delivered it to your house, we just say before you, definitely when you're handling it, to clean the outside surface and then immediately, regardless if it's been sitting outside for three days or not, wash your hands immediately. Treat every surface as if it can potentially be contaminated. And that way you just do, because it's hard to, it's hard to remember, oh, did they say three days? Did they say five days? You know, I, I saw on a cruise ship, it said 17 days um, that it was positive for the, uh, I think it was the Princess Cruise when they tested. Um, they can still see signs of the virus. And that's why regardless, washing your hands after each and every interaction is going to be the thing that can most safely, um, yeah, keep you safe. So that's the one intervention. So if you don't remember any time, don't worry about it. Just wash your hands. Okay. <laughs> now, if a person believes they've come into contact uh, with the virus, what should they do? I know that um, there's a lot of confusion of why uh, people are asking people not to go to the emergency room if they believe they may have been infected or have symptoms. Why is that not the best practice? And if they shouldn't report directly to the hospital, what should they do? I can give a quick example, then uh, I'll ping pong after Dr. Mitchell. But um, so the way I think about it is like this. If you were to fall and if you were walking down some stairs and you twisted your ankle and you hurt yourself, right? We know that your ankle is hurt, but would you at that point expect to go to the hospital to get a X-ray of your um, of your ankle and say, "I want you to operate it on operate on it immediately," or would you say, "I know I'm injured. I'm going to see how my body can kind of heal itself," right? So for the most part, the major the vast majority of people that um, come into contact with COVID nineteen are going to be with very mild to no symptoms at all. And what is and what is mild? That can be, you know, very subjective, right? Some people, what hurts some people doesn't hurt other people. So mild symptoms meaning a nagging cough. Um, you may have fever, feeling very fatigued, um, like basically like you have the flu times 100, where you just feel like crap, right? Those people, what we, what we, what we classify as being mild is that your oxygen level is still fine. You're still able to breathe. Um, well, your blood pressure is staying nice and normal. You're not having any signs and symptoms that any organ is being really stretched. You may feel like crap, but your body is still maintaining. So for those people, imagine that's you spraining your ankle of where we say, sit at home, treat your symptoms, meaning, you know, keep, um, keep your body as far as your, your temperature. You can take Tylenol, making sure you note how much Tylenol you're taking. Tylenol is not a medicine that you should freely take. If you get over four grams of Tylenol a day, you can do damage to your liver. So read the bottle and take it only as directed. But that being said, 
if you're not having true difficulty breathing, if you're not having any signs and symptoms that your blood pressure is getting low, like you're about to pass out, or you're having any crushing chest pain, then we say your symptoms can be managed at home. That being said, that does not mean we don't want you to call us for sure. If anything is bothering you, we want to know your doctor should be in touch. If it concerns you, it should also concern us. But we're saying for those people, we don't necessarily want you to come into the hospital because if you're already fighting off a viral infection in the hospital, we know bacteria love to live in the hospital and you can potentially pick up a bacterial infection on top of this viral infection. And then we can have a big problem. So I'll pass it off to Dr. Mitchell to help explain. Mm, hi. Yes. So um, one the question I'll just repeat it is basically why you shouldn't initially possibly come into um, the hospital um, when you think you may have been exposed or you may have symptoms. So um, the reason for that um, is, as she said, what we would like for you to do, let's go over the first directions, is contact your prim primary care physician. And for those who don't have primary care physicians, you can probably contact your local health department or the emergency room. Um, then they can direct you specifically, hopefully, to a testing center where you can be scheduled to come in for testing. And this is, as Dr. Hilton said before, if you have mild disease, um, this, this is what we want you to do. And because if the, there is the possibility that you have been exposed, when you go into the hospital, there may be people in the waiting area that you may also expose as well. It's the whole part part and why we stress social distancing um, to begin with. So it's really a process. Yes, we want to see you. Yes, we want to know. And I think for our community, the biggest thing I want to stress is it's not that we don't want you to contact your, your healthcare provider. We do want you to contact your healthcare provider because we have a tendency to delay treatment um, or contact our healthcare providers. We want you to contact them and hopefully they can direct you to the, the, the next, what the next step is, whether that's testing or coming into the office mm -hmm. and uh, being evaluated for your symptoms. So. Um, Dr. Bell, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, you guys, you guys did a really good job um, already. But the only thing I would add is that um, if you do need care, uh, seek care. Uh, so if your symptoms are so bad that you feel like you can't make it at home, um, or if you feel like you fell and broke your ankle, um, we still need you to come in and, and seek that care. Um, we, there's a higher bar to come in because um, we want to make sure that um, we're being safe and not uh, preventing the spread and social distancing. But um, the whole idea of all of what we're doing, uh, social distancing, making sure that we keep hospitals and, and clinics able to take care of patients is so that we can take care of COVID patients, but we can also take care of any other need that happens. There's still going to be car crashes. There's still going to be heart attacks. There's still going to be people who uh, regular things happen to. And we need to be able to take care of those people too. So by all means, if you, if you need to be seen, be seen. Great. I'll just add also, it seems like Jersey City is in a great place. Like Councilwoman Ridley mentioned that you have two testing sites available. So that's really incredible where there are so many people, as we know, in particular in our communities, unfortunately, who don't have the primary care doctor they can just call, as many of us are advising. Um, so the opportunity to be able to call not one but two sites, make an appointment, potentially get tested is really potentially um, opening up the health system to be able to receive care. So I think it's a, you guys live in an amazing city that has that opportunity and would definitely take advantage of that if you can. Thank you. Uh, now there is uh, some medical jargon that sometimes confuses people. Uh, when we say that people can be carriers and asymptomatic, what exactly does asymptomatic mean? And then at times we'll have uh, people who we say are being monitored or under investigation. And uh, some people hear that and automatically assume that person has tested positive, that that's not really uh, what we mean. So can you explain the difference between somebody that's assumed positive, asymptomatic and under investigation? I'll give an example for the asymptomatic that I like to use. Um, so everyone knows of someone who has um, cold sores, for instance, right? Um, these people carry the virus in their body. You may not see it from day to day, but every now and then that expression of the virus presents itself. 
So with asymptomatic people with the COVID-19, they may not show any outward physical signs. They may not have the fever. They may not have the, the cough. They may not have the, um, the chest pain or the shortness of breath or the headache or the loss of taste and hearing that we hear people complain of, but they are still carrying the virus inside of them and they can still pass it off to you. So that's what we mean by asymptomatic. Asymptomatic means without symptoms, but still infected. Um, so anyone else want to piggyback off of, of the other questions that she was mentioning? But that's the, I think that's the one that gets people the most confused of, yeah. oh, they look completely fine, so why? Yes, um, we know of many, many times of other disease processes where you, there's no outward sign that anything is going on, but we know that inside of the body, that virus still claims home. So same thing. This is actually one of the reasons that the virus spreads really well. And because in that phase before people have symptoms or when they have mild symptoms, the virus can spread pretty easily. So you can actually pass it on even if you don't have symptoms. Um, and that's why it's important to stay away from people because that's protecting you and it's protecting them in case um, it can spread that way. Um, in the case of, of uh, SARS and MERS, which were also novel coronaviruses at the time, um, they were actually more deadly than the COVID-19, but they didn't spread as easily. And one of the reasons was um, by the time you got sick, that's actually when you started to shed the virus, which means you could pass it on to others. So these people were very, very ill in the hospital, in the clinic, seeking out care. And that's when they started to spread the virus. So there wasn't a long period before where they were able to pass it on. But with the new coronavirus, um, it's kind of found that sweet spot where it can, you know, it can set up shop in, in your body and your cells. It can spread to others and you may not even know that you're sick or you may have mild symptoms and think of something else. Um, so that's what makes it made it so dangerous. Uh, the other the other part of that question was about um, presumed positive and, and what does that mean? Uh, there are a couple of things that we have to consider when we do a test. Um, there are no tests that are 100 percent perfect. Uh, and the way that you test for the coronavirus, at least the way we do it now, is we take a swab, we put it in the back of the throat, uh, through the mouth or through the nose. And we take a sample of your cells uh, to see if there's any virus particle there, so a part of the virus. And then we, we do a test to see if we can uh, see if it's there. So it depends on a few things. It depends on how much virus might be there in the back of your throat. It depends on how good the nurse or physician is doing the swab to actually get all the way back there. And it depends on what phase of the illness you're in. Because like I said before, if you're in an earlier phase, um, you may be able to transmit, but you may not have as much virus in your throat. Uh, so there are some times when um, the tests may be negative, but we'll say this patient has classic symptoms. Um, and because we're worried, even though it's negative, we might say we're still going to presume it's positive And we treat as if the patient has COVID disease, even if we can't document that with the test. And that's important because we have we actually have data and, and examples out of China where they had patients who uh, were later found to be positive by doing more invasive tests. So, you know, doing a sample really deep down in the lungs that were able to show a positive. But when they checked in the nostrils or in the mouth, those tests were negative. So we've seen documented cases where the tests that we're doing, you know, as good as we can get. Um, can still sometimes be negative. And, and if the symptoms fit and we want to be very conservative, we might say this person probably still has COVID disease, even if they tested negative. Okay. And I think a big point to remember too, as so it's one of these situations where we rather presume you're positive and get you isolated so you can potentially not contaminate anyone else than say, we don't know and let you go out into the world. What we know is that this, this the way it spreads, um, to give you an analogy, we're thinking for every one person that gets infected, you have the potential to contaminate or infect up to four people. And those four people will then have the potential to infect up to four more people, right? So by 30 days, that one person, if I was the one infected, I have the potential to infect a million people in 30 days. And so when we say you're presumed, we're, we're working on that idea of I would rather treat you as if you are. What we know is despite the fact we tested over 3.6 million people, there's over 300 million Americans. So for every 1 million people in America, we've only tested 10,000. That's not a lot. And so, um, and so we, we, don't, we know we don't have enough tests to say we're going to test everyone. So what we instead say is we're going to presume 
we're going to presume that you actually do have it because this one test that I do have available, I need to make sure that if someone walks into the hospital and they cannot breathe, I need to have this test to see is the reason they can't breathe because of the coronavirus? Is the reason they can't breathe because of a blood clot that went to their lungs? Is the reason they can't breathe because they had a bacterial infection? All those things, different reasons of why you can't breathe, but I, I have to tailor my, my interventions based on what's actually causing you not to be able to breathe. And so we, we reserve those tests for, because there, there are only so many tests that we have available. We reserve those for the sickest of sickest of people so we can get them the help that they need. And so that's why we, we tend to say for other people, if you're, like I said, if you're able to maintain, we say, we presume you are, we just need to treat, we want you to treat yourself as if you are positive. Go home, isolate as much as possible, um, practice the social distancing, wear the mask in the house if you have one, um, so that you don't necessarily contaminate everyone else that's in the house and try to keep yourself to one room as much as possible. Great. And if we say someone is uh, under investigation or being monitored, that just usually means they're waiting for their test results to come back? It could be. It could be that because we know there's, especially earlier on, we were waiting We were waiting for tests to be resulted for over a week, right? Now mm -hmm. our testing is getting a little bit better, and, and uh, maybe Reginald Swift, um, the founder and CEO of Rubik's LS, can talk about testing on his end of things. But um, but it could be that, yes, we're waiting on a test to come back and result as positive or negative. Or it may be that we haven't offered a test because we don't have one, but you have all the signs and symptoms that suggest that COVID may be likely. Um, or it may be even this. We know that our tests are not 100 percent positive. Right. Um, we don't have one that can, that is 100 percent at this point. So there's a margin of error of where you could test it, come back negative, but you still have the virus. And so what we say is that if the signs and symptoms are more suggestive that you might possibly have it, we still want you to treat yourself as if you are positive. Keep yourself as isolated as possible, like I said, um, to try to prevent as much cross-contamination of other people. Okay. Reggie, you want to talk to that? Yes, yes, absolutely. So when uh, Dr. Hilton is discussing about the, the rapid test or any type of test, there are several types that are out there now. Some of them are, you know, approved through the Emergency Use Act, and some of them aren't, right? We have what you've called the, the cotton swab test, right? You, you see the uh, long cotton swab, you, you take it in the back of the throat, you do the viral swab, and you detect a virus strain uh, in the back of the throat. Uh, we also have what you call a blood test, or in the medical professional community, uh, immunoassay test. And that is to really detect the antibodies within the blood that have shown that there's an indicator for the COVID, uh, COVID-19. And you also have the viral and you also have um, some specific areas where people are now trying to do air uh, sample testing, uh, which not sure how effective that's going to be. But within each of these types of testing mechanisms, you have what they call specificity. And that is to really drive, and that word means for testing to really identify from a consistency standpoint how accurate that test can actually represent uh, the, the, the nature of identifying that viral strain consistently and repeatedly. And that's what is usually done from a laboratory setting. That's usually the, the type of mechanism to say, yes, this patient is presenting positive uh, symptoms for COVID and is tested positive against the uh, viral strain identified. Uh, we also have uh, some of the tests available, the test methods available where We've actually created a prototype device that can actually detect droplet strains within the air, right? And that is with a mass prototype that we actually created. And that's something that we are, we're looking to really uh, associate with a lot of other groups to really scale up that product to be as effective as possible. Because we know that it's a, a communicable disease and we want to be sure that uh, we, we actually have preventative measures to be as specific as possible. Now, in way of uh, some of the testing and some of the new tests that they're, they're trying to develop, um, I know that in speaking with my physician, we were discussing uh, possible new tests that I guess they're, they're working on to determine if you have had COVID-19, because there are people who feel like they've had it already, but I don't think at this time we have a test that can tell if you've had it already, and if you've had it, are you now immune? 
right? Because I, with the flu, yes. I'm wrong, you can't get the same strand again. But do we know that yet for COVID-19 and are they working on those tests? So I'm glad that you asked and I'll let someone else take it after I give my you know, initial thoughts. So what they're coming up with right now is an antibody test. And that usually, again, was, as I was mentioned before, is the ability to detect any virus strain that was already in the body, right? So right now, there it takes a long time to create an antibody, uh, you know, from a, a person that had it before, right? So what they're also trying to accomplish is not just from an antibody standpoint, but also antigens. Antigens is just kind of a, a compressed fashion of the viral expression of the antibody factor. To be able to then say, okay, we're going to give it to this person, and then we're going to have either a proof positive or a proof negative to determine if that patient prevented, you know, had presented symptoms before or prior to this testing. That's to then, then give the indication or indicator to say, okay, well, let's test this person again to determine if there is a new strain within the body. Okay, good. So for um, our immune system, I know one day I, I was out shopping and there were quite a few people in the vitamin aisle and there was this lady and her husband and she's like, we don't need to get these vitamins. It's not going to stop you from getting coronavirus. And I thought to myself, well, she's somewhat right. But at the same time, don't we want to make sure we're building up our immune system so that if we do get it, we're, we have a better chance of fighting it off. And so should we be taking those steps to make sure we're building our immune system? And with that, what are some vitamins that people should be uh, taking? What are some uh, vitamins and natural uh, substances that boost our immune system? I'll say this right quick and then I'll pass it off to Dr. Essien. But um, if you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. <laughs> That um, that's just where I'm from. So <laughs> meaning that if you, if we for sure, and I know it's easier said than done. I know it's uh, it cap it costs four dollars to get one avocado, and it, it costs you know ten dollars to get a whole pack of oodles and noodles. I know because that was my life, um, and so I know it's it's very easy for us to say, oh, eat healthier. Um, we know this virus kills, but so does poverty. And we know the influx and the, the impact that um, that the lack of, of money and funds can have on um, vulnerable populations, particularly black and brown populations and lower socioeconomic status populations. We know that the, um, the food deserts and the food apartheid that happens within black and brown communities fully understand that we are asking um, this vulnerable population to make up for a system that didn't necessarily support them in the first place to eat healthy. So um, that being said, but um, it still stands that if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. So Dr. Essien, what, what vitamins do you think um, should be included? Yeah, no, that's obviously an important point. And for me, the and I'll, I'll, I'll um, defer to others who may have other vitamin recommendations, but as a primary care doc, um, I find it very, very challenging to recommend certain vitamins out there because like, Councilwoman really mentioned there is no um, preventive cure to um, coronavirus, the novel coronavirus, COVID-19, or SARS-CoV-2 without the vaccines. So the best thing that you can do for your immune system right now is wash your hands, is social distancing, um, and to wear that mask so that we can stay out of the hospitals, we can stay out of the health centers, so we can allow folks like Dr. Bell and his colleagues and my colleagues here in the University of Pittsburgh to continue to work on vaccines to help prevent this um, virus from, from spreading around our communities. Um, right now, unfortunately, again, there are no magic pills or magic cures that we can take. Obviously, staying healthy, keeping our um, hypertension, diabetes, and some of the big chronic risk factors that put us, our communities at higher risk of dying from this infection is important. But everything we can do, as has been mentioned, to, um, to stay safe ourselves and keep our family members and communities safe. We'll continue to help support the health system to um, develop vaccines to help prevent this disease. Um, I can add that there are, uh, I'm, I'm going to qualify this with, I'm not living up to this, um, but we can all have dreams. Um, but there are certain things that we should do and some things that we should not be doing. So um, trying to eat healthy, as Dr. Hilton said, is absolutely, absolutely crucial. And um, trying to uh, increase your consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables 
the things that are on the outside of the grocery store, if you go to a grocery store, rather than things that are in the middle of the grocery store. The middle tends to have the processed things and that have high sugar, high salt content. Um, your fresh fruits and vegetables will be on the edge along with fresh breads. Um, try to get enough sleep, um, which uh, I'm trying, um, but, um, but, but it's important. Your immune system works better when you're well rested. So adults on average will need seven hours of sleep per night. Um, and but you know your own body and you know if you if you've gotten enough or not. So getting good sleep is also important. Um, washing your hands, like Dr. Essien says, is um, incredibly important. And then the things that um, that we could stop doing that could make our immune system function better. Uh, this is a great time to stop smoking if you smoke. And I know from being a primary care physician that it's one of the hardest things for people to quit. Um, but um, you know, out of China, eight out of ten men smoked. And they saw much higher rates of men getting really critically ill from the coronavirus. And they thought it was linked to lung disease that happened when you spoke. Um, so uh, if this is something that concerns you and you're still smoking, um, it's a good good opportunity to stop that. In addition, drinking alcohol in excess suppresses your immune system um, and uh, drinking sugary drinks, high salt content foods. So all these things are things that we can do to keep us healthy. Mind you, you know, we're trying, you know, as physicians too, we're probably not living up to all of those standards, but, um, but these are what we can do to try to keep ourselves healthier. And Dr. Dr. Coleman Ridley, I don't know how I missed this. Actually, Dr. Mitchell is a registered dietitian, so I don't know why we didn't go to her first. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. I was waiting to chime in, but Dr. Bell really just hit everything um, that needed to be said. Is the idea, as you said, Dr. Hilton, is... First, you need to be be as healthy as possible. So if you have any chronic diseases, definitely make sure that those things are controlled and um, that they are managed properly. The second thing, as Dr. Bell said, is making sure you're getting fresh fruits, vegetables, water, and sleep. Those are really the key things. And, and I'm going to say this with my nutrition background. There are a lot of vitamin supplements out there. And um, yes, our body we need certain amounts, actually smaller amounts than our, that are in a, a large quantity of the vitamin supplements that are out there. And one of the things we like to say is when people load up on all those vitamins and, and, and um, uh, supplements, they're really just making, if it's water soluble, um, expensive urine because most of it is excreted by, <laughs> is excreted. You only need small quantities. If you're eating healthy, then you should, get what you need from the foods that you're eating. Now, I'll say all that, that some people do need additional vitamins um, out there. And some of those vitamins are required for, um, for the immune system and by the immune system. But these supplements are not regulated by the FDA. So there has not been real studies that really shown the efficacy of taking, you know, certain specific amounts and, um, I, I tread lightly because, yes, some of them are beneficial, specifically vitamin C, um, vitamin E, and vitamin B6 um, have been shown to um, be involved in the immune system, but really hasn't shown to, say, fight off disease per se. Um, and some of these vitamins can be um, toxic if you take them in large quantities, um, specifically your fat, so, um, fat soluble uh, vitamins, because they stay within the fat tissue or your adipose tissue um, longer where your water soluble uh, vitamins you do excrete. So ideally to sum it up, um, eat fresh fruits and vegetables. If you require additional um, supplementation, um, please speak with um, either your physician or a registered dietitian about what you're taking over the counter. Definitely get sleep because sleep we know is known to dampen the immune system. And for my pregnant ladies, please, um, you know, wash your hands, um, practice social distancing and all of those things, because women um, who are pregnant um, do have a weaker immune system because they're carrying a child. So um, do all those necessary things. Great. I um, am going to pull two quick questions from the Facebook feed, and then I want to segue into our next topic very quickly. Uh, I'll go with this one to Dr. Bell. Someone asks, if you have recovered from COVID-19, can you donate blood? And then that made me think of um, something else that I'll, I'll direct to uh, 
Reginald Swift is I know that I've seen some people who have recovered that are now donating plasma, right, for a test. Can you explain what that test is? But first, can they donate blood if they have recovered from COVID-19? Yes, you can donate blood um, if you have COVID-19. It, it goes through a regular screening process that's been set up by the uh, Red Cross and other public health agencies. And it's actually something of, of a lot of interest um, to researchers and, and um, other people interested in treating COVID um, because the blood that um, someone who's um, recovered from COVID might have enough antibodies to provide protection to someone else who gets sick. Um, so it's absolutely not a reason that you can't donate blood and it might be something that people are interested in doing. And I'll let Reggie talk about a little bit more of the science behind that. Oh yeah, thank you, Dr. Bell. So yes, with, with plasma and, and patients being able to donate plasma, it's the ability for healthy patients and even those who are re kind of recovering to have the platelets form within the, the sick and, and the ones who are affected uh, immune system so that they can recover much faster. It's the ability to try and regenerate a lot of the specific you know, cells and, and a lot of the groupings within the chronic condition to help them recover much faster. So hopefully that's given a little bit of the broad base of understanding what why people are doing that. It's to be able to have their antibodies go into their system, I mean, from an antibody from an infected person to a person who is also infected, but also uh, is trying to recover. It's going to help them recover much faster. Okay. And to give you a simple, um, let's see here. to give you a simple graphic of what I showed my four-year-old niece, so let's say this is the virus, right? Your body, your immune system um, produces antibodies. So your, your white blood cells are your immune system, right? They're the soldiers of your body. They end up producing this thing called an antibody. So let's say the antibody looks in a shape like this, right? And that antibody is supposed to recognize and fit that virus. So every time it sees um, any component of that virus, your body produces this antibody that says, go connect to that, um, to that virus so we can get rid of it, right? So what we're doing is when we get blood from someone who has already been infected, they already saw, their body already saw the virus, so they have a lot of these little antibodies in their bloodstream floating around. We want to say, hey, if you've had that infection, come into the hospital or go into these testing centers of where we can get your blood so we can isolate out these antibodies. So now if someone comes into the hospital who is really, really sick and they have a lot of these little viruses floating around in their body, we can give them your blood that has this antibody that can get that virus and take it away. That's what I told my little four-year-old niece, Mook Mook, <laughs> Olivia, who I absolutely <laughs> love. But that's the way, that's the way um, it, it works. The antibodies is when we're making all these drugs like remde um, remdesivir and, and um, Plaquenil or, hydro or hydroxychloroquine that you hear you know, President Trump talked about. All these drugs, we're trying to basically do what the body is naturally designed to do. Um, we're not as good as the body. We never will be as good as the body. Um, but, but the body, that's what the antibodies are trying to do. It's trying to rid your body of the virus itself. Okay. Thanks. Great. Now, speaking of uh, President Trump, very quickly before we make our segue. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we know that there seems lately to be this uh, new push to open the country and let's do it very quickly. What is your, your stance on that uh, or your recommendation um, as to when we should uh, get back to normal life? Do you think we are ready? So um, I'll, I'm sure we all have something to say about this. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, let me just take the first step. I think that uh, we do need to reopen a country at some point um, because um, not being able to work and and um, and not and resuming your normal sort of life, you know, that has an effect too. Mm -hmm. That said, we have to make sure that it's safe. And what we know is that once we do open a country back up, um, more people are going to get infected because we're not doing as much social distancing. And that's just the way that it's going to work because the virus is still running its course to the country and the world. Um, what you absolutely need is an aggressive and robust testing effort so that you can test people when they have symptoms and isolate them because when you, when you, what you would expect when you have cases when they come back up once we open up the country, uh, we need to be able to test those people, isolate them and pull them aside and quarantine them, give them the support that they can quarantine if they can't. 
um, so that we're prepared for this. Um, I want to go back to a point Dr. Hilton made. We've tested a little over three and a half million people. There are well more than 300 million people in the country. We tested one out of 100, 1% 1 of people. That's as if uh, we tested all of Phoenix, we tested all of Philadelphia, and then for the whole country, we said, because of what's going on in Phoenix and Philadelphia, I know what's going on in the whole country. It's absolutely not enough. Um, estimates uh, say, you know, public health experts say that we need to do around 500,000 tests per day um, in order to have a, a robust enough effort to say that we can safely open up the country and aggressively test people and make sure that we can isolate them. So a half million people per day is the recommendation. We've tested three and a half million so far. So we're nowhere near where we need to get to. And uh, this notion that it can be pushed to the states and they can handle it without an aggressive coordinated federal effort really frustrates me. Um, but um, I think the point is, you know, there are certain things need to have in place to make it safe to open up the country. And we're, we're not quite there yet. And I'll let um, some of my friends take over. Dr. Hilton, I know you've talked oh, about this. Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, it, to give you an idea, so as you said, you know, there's recommendation we should be testing up to 500,000 a day, and we're right now testing about 140,000 a day. It's not enough. So in order to, to be as safe as possible, and again, I know the virus kills, so does poverty. I understand the economic um, strain that has been placed on families. I, I can't imagine what it's like. I don't have children. I don't, I can imagine what it's like to feel like I don't have money to feed them. So I don't take this lightly at all. Um, so I do think we have to work hand in hand. And that's why I'm very um, glad that you, Congresswoman, um, are allowing us to have this, this talk with you because I think it's going to take policymakers and physicians alike and scientists alike to discuss these to find what's the best, softest spot for us to land. Because we do have to do the three T's testing tracing and treatment, right? Those are the three things that we have to have in place before we can make any move. Testing the person, tracing that person, meaning that once I know that you're a positive, I need to know who all have you come into contact within the last 14 days because I need to be able to, to test them as well, right? And make sure then all those people, how many people they come into contact these last 14 days. That's the only way we're going to be able to truly get a hold of this. And then the treatment phase is going to be isolation more than anything else. And do we have the resources that if I tell this person, I have to have you in your house for 14 days, then are we providing them with enough food? Are we providing them with a with um, the ability to pay their rent and their mortgage, knowing that they're going to be put out in the streets? Um, are we providing them that if they're a single parent, that someone is going to be able to help them take care of their children because there's no one else for them? And so I completely... I, I pray for our country. Um, what we know for sure is that this this is not, you hear President Trump talking often about a lot of things, but he, he keeps on making these suggestions of, oh, New York doesn't need all these ventilators. Look, they didn't even have that many sick people. We are still in the middle, very much in the very early stages of this pandemic. We haven't even begun to uh, scratch the surface in many, many of our counties and many of our states. So we have to figure out a way to support each other in this acute phase so that we can all make it to see 2021 together. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if anyone else, um, Dr. Mitchell, Dr. Yesen, you have anything? I, I think you guys spoke well on, on the issue. I feel like every point that was made um, is, is what, how we need to be thinking about it right now. I just want to say that um, I think we need to think about this in a more global um, mindset because I can honestly tell you the individuals that are rushing to open the country can still work from home and be isolated and don't have to worry about being exposed yeah. if we if we have another surge, they have the ability to not be exposed and to self-quarantine for longer periods. The people who are going to suffer the most are going to be the people who are economically disadvantaged or don't have access to health care or don't have the ability to stay home for an additional 14 days. These are the people that are going to suffer. So I want to encourage people, if you have concerns about this, you need to contact um, your local 
government and express your concern because I honestly, as Dr. Hilton and Dr. Bell both said, we are not at a point where we have tested enough people to say that it is okay to open this country back up. Great. Yeah, that's, a, that's a good uh, segue into our, our next topic that I'm really going to put on the table and kind of let you guys run with it. But it's uh, COVID-19 and the African-American community. Um, we know that recently the uh, Surgeon General made some very public comments about the impact to the African-American community. And just as a little uh, background for everyone listening, um, I was on a phone call a few weeks ago. I posted about it and I told you that we would set something up. And here it is uh, on a Congressional Black Caucus conference call. And Dr. Hilton was on that call. It was weeks before, um, you know, the Surgeon General made his statements. And, you know, that's no knock to him. He said it when, when he said it and when he needed to say it. And, um, you know, I thank him for saying that publicly. Um, but Dr. Hilton on that call was discussing the impact that it's going to have on black and brown communities um, because we are at a higher disadvantage. So I want to kind of segue into some of that now and ask why do you feel the impact would be greater to the minority communities as opposed to other communities? Right. I mean, it would, it literally was one of those things where um, the first case of coronavirus here in the United States was documented in January 17. Um, the first death was February 29th. And immediately I knew the black and brown people were going to have a problem. Reason being, you, ha you hear often that um, the elderly population and those with, with chronic conditions are more dis um, are kind of predisposed to dying from the coronavirus. What we know is that hypertension, diabetes, um, uh, heart disease has set roots into the lower socioeconomic status communities and the black and brown communities. What is not talked about, though, and this is what I had a problem with um, with the Surgeon General about is you can't talk about those conditions without talking about why those conditions live in the black and brown community. You can't talk about those conditions without addressing systemic racism and the way that this, the structure of our communities were designed that way to promote those diseases being prevalent. Um, you can go as back, far back as the 1930s with the redlining and how black um, and brown communities were etched out where there were no healthy food options that were placed in the community that um, industries were allowed to build their toxic um, companies where they were spewing, you know, dirty um, pollution into our air and dirty pollution into our waters. You can't talk about asthma and chronic bronchitis without the influence of those industries on our lungs and our children's lungs development. You can't talk about obesity um, with, and, and diabetes without talking about the fact that in heavily populated black and brown communities, there's not even a sidewalk for you to walk around in order to get to have this, this physical interaction. Um, and so, yes, uh, that's those, those structures, those systems, um, even with, with, you know, policing and the longer prison citizening and the targeting of black and brown men and putting them in prison, that's a vulnerable population now that we're saying, oh, we need to watch out for our prisoners. Yeah, you need to watch out for our prisoners and you also need to stop putting our men in prison in the, in the manner that you are. But that being the case, um, those are the things that I wish the Surgeon General would have spoken on when he's talking about um, telling black and brown people um, to be careful, because in certain ways, his tone was almost to blame black and brown people um, for having these conditions and not realizing that we're not victims, but we very much are targets in, in this. And so coronavirus, this, this, this idea of racial health disparities is not new. It's not just... Um, COVID-19 that's killing black people at higher rates. Black people have higher death rates for eight of the 13 leading causes of death. Um, and so this has been a problem that Dr. Mitchell can talk about as far as black and brown um, women dying around pregnancy, that we're burying our children before their first birthday at two to three times higher rates than any other race. And it's the structural things that we have to kind of address now and after COVID-19 that would help to shift the system so the entire nation can be healthy because those essential workers that we are ignoring, the ones that are living in these vulnerable populations, those are, those are the grocery store workers. They're the ones that's working at Walmart and Target. They're the ones that's driving the bus, right? So when we open up this community, 
those people that you ignored, that you didn't test, trace, and treat, those people are going to be now the asymptomatic patients are people that are working in the very stores that when the healthcare privilege and the healthcare elite come and get to their supplies for their house, they're going to pick up that virus too. And so we must start to address this. And I don't know if you want to talk about that, um, Dr. Mitchell, on what you see with your patients. Um, of course, you know, I, I, disparities is definitely something that's really big. Um, maternal mortality um, in the black community is a hot topic. And I mean, we're still in or just ending um, Black Maternal Health Week as we speak. So um, I, it kind of touches home because it. I'm a woman, I am a minority, and these are the people that, you know, I love to advocate. These are family members. This is family to me. Um, so that's why it matters. And I think it is irresponsible because we're not testing like we should in those communities. And these are going to be the hardest hit communities um, that are out there. And we all know, even we can take it from a political standpoint or in general health. And I do some research and I've done research in the past. And what I have seen is you can go by zip code, you can overlay the do a geo map and overlay the rates of diabetes, high mor uh, maternal mortality rate and high infant mortality rate. And whether it's diabetes, obesity, hypertension, heart disease, all of those things um, can be seen within a certain community. Um, and it's all by um, design because in those places, if you do a little bit more research, you will notice there are food deserts. And for people who don't know what food deserts are, those are places that don't have uh, grocery stores within walking distance. So therefore, they cannot provide uh, fresh food options for people. And then we go back to say, well, why is the rates of obesity so high? Well, they don't have access to great food. They have access to food that is not as healthy. And then you can go into other communities and zip codes and you will know, not see um, some of those unhealthy choices um, that are present um, in, in our communities. And so I think we have to really look at it from the standpoint of, of a, a healthy society. And it's eventually going to trickle down because to everyone else, because if you don't have your bus drivers, if you don't have your grocery store workers, if you don't have those people, then how are we really going to open up? Because these are the people that are going to be hit the most. And I think, um, you know, we made this call along with the help of uh, Reggie um, a few weeks ago um, because, you know, the numbers are important, but ultimately um, it's personal for us. And my mom works at Target. My dad is a bus driver. Um, they're a couple of the most stand-up people I know. They're very proud of what they do. Um, they serve their community in their way, and, uh, and they're at risk. Um, so the coronavirus doesn't care about these barriers that we erect between ourselves, race, ethnicity, your walk of life, um, what your family looks like, your color of your skin, what language you speak. It does not care. It just requires that you be a human being. And so we have to respond similarly, a break down the barriers that we erect between ourselves and make sure that we take care of vulnerable populations because for the coronavirus, we're all family. So we need to all be family too and take care of, um, of where we need to, where the holes are, get the data, fix the gaps, reverse our disparities and make it so that, um, you know, what determines your health is your habits and not um, where you live and, and, and what you do when there's structural barriers that are placed before you. And Dr. Essien, I know you do a lot of work in this area as well too. I'd love to hear your comments. Yeah, I think everything that's been said already is really thoughtful and incredible. Um, and it's being said, I think the fact of the matter is that we just pulled up this morning my, my usual search in the medical literature. And today there are 4,600 um, medical papers written about COVID-19. And this week, the first two that even mentioned race related to COVID-19 came out. So two out of 4,600 um, essays, papers, research articles, et cetera, came out about COVID-19. And that's an embarrassment to our field. Um, that is a sign that we are not treating ourselves as family, whether it's the medical journal editors or um, folks who are in leadership in the health systems in this country. And it's um, just like I, I believe it did with maternal health, it's taking the journalists and policymakers 
um, like yourself, um, Councilwoman Ridley, to really call out this issue. And it's taken the folks like us, the fact that it is personal for us, the fact that it's affecting our families, our communities. We're not only on the front lines on a day-to-day -day basis, caring for patients like Dr. Bell and Dr. Hilton in the ICUs or ourselves in, um, in primary care settings, but we're also thinking about these data and wondering about our family members. And that's not what it should be like. Like all of us should be in this um, fight together. And so I think, again, I applaud you, Dr. Um, Councilwoman, really for bringing up this issue in, in this setting. Um, I'm hoping that other journalists continue to call this issue out, and I'm hoping that we as um, healthcare providers and researchers, scientists, et cetera, continue to call out our different fields and really make sure that these, these issues are being emphasized. It's not um, only one setting. It's not only the black journalists who should be thinking about this or the black doctors. All of us should because um, that's the only way that we're going to be able to address this issue. And I'm, and I'm happy that everyone has uh, provided really valuable insight. Now, for me, coming from a data and a clinical trial standpoint, there are approximately 54 clinical trials right now for COVID-19 across the globe. And there's about 30 or so within the United States. Now, when we're talking about access to care for African-American communities, there are about there is one uh, county, and it's in California, that has actually been successful in getting into the remdesivir trial. Well, why is that? Why are we limiting ourselves to say these are the only types of patients that are available to have uh, the ability to access clinical trials? Now, if we're talking about underlying conditions and uh, specific access to health and access to care, we need to be sure that the data that we're, we're uh, putting together, as well as the broader community, as well as like our friends here on this call, uh, that we actually make it actionable to get the types of vaccines that are being created to work on people like us. Not just saying uh, it's a mask for, for something else to happen. We want to be sure that even if we have underlying conditions, the, the types of vaccines that are being created take into that into effect to determine, okay, what's our biological makeup? How can we actually um, re reformulate this, uh, this vaccine or this, this antigen or this specific uh, therapeutic effect to have a better outcome for people like us? So hopefully that, that helps bridge a little bit more of that, that uh, identity too. Yeah, and in speaking with uh, vaccines, I know that that uh, makes a lot of people of color nervous. Um, and rightfully so, if you look at some of our history and, and you know, some of the tests that were done on um, you know, African-American people, like I, for one, am not in a rush to go out and get the vaccine, <laughs> you know, honestly speaking. So how, one, how, I guess, what are ways or how can we have access to information to make sure that once something is created, it's safe? I know there's talk of a possible Bill Gates vaccine. I don't know how true that is, but how do we kind of do our research to make sure it's safe? And then at the same time, what can we do, um, those of us um, in leadership roles, to make sure that our communities have access to those vaccines or you know those tests that are being created? I'll, I'll talk about one thing first and then I'll pass it off to Dr. Bell um, or to whoever want to answer. But for sure, so the black community, I complete, I am black. Um, my name literally means black. I understand that there is a, a lack of trust um, for not only the government, but the healthcare system. The, the history of healthcare as far as black, black people is horrendous. We know the Tuskegee experiment. If we want to talk about the, the, um, the neglect of black people, look at Flint, Michigan today with the water supply. Comple I completely understand that. And I completely understand the hesitancy to, um, to once you've been hurt to open that door again. But what I am saying is when a vaccine becomes available, I'm going to be one of the first people to show up. Meaning, and the reason being is that we see now, you know, we often have to have these kind of campaigns of the anti-vaxxers saying, don't vaccinate your kid, don't vaccinate your kid, don't vaccinate your kid. Well, this coronavirus, this COVID-19 has shown us what happens when we don't have a vaccine for one virus, right? This is the, the widespread of, of death that um, we could be seeing. We, like I said, last night, I think there was close to, what, 
2,500 people that um, died in the United States. Um, we we have to we have to think of ways that we can keep this virus from being as deadly as it was the first time. And what we know currently, 70% of all those dying across the nation are black people. And we got to wrap our head around that. The fact that if, if again, based on the system, and it is not black people's fault, but we're in a system of where our neighborhoods have kind of set us up for these chronic illnesses to be our friend, right? This high blood pressure, diabetes, hyper, you know, that's, we got to fight against that, right? But because our body is fighting against that, this virus and this threat of this virus is costing us our life. And we're very much in the early stages of what this thing is going to look like. But I would be hard pressed to say that um, someone doesn't know someone who has a family member that has either died from coronavirus or came very, very close to dying. And so, and like I said, we don't expect this wave to be over until late into the summertime, if not September, right? So we haven't seen anything yet. So when it comes down to this vaccine, of which we're not going to have a vaccine anytime soon anyway, but I want, I personally want um, to start this, this conversation of healing for black people and, and working on ways that the, the healthcare system can earn the trust, because I think that should be earned, but earn the trust of black and brown people again, um, because we, we got to do something to get our people healthier. Anybody else? Yeah, Dr. Um, Essie and I know what, um, what it was like to train in Boston in the Mass General Hospital. And uh, we got the question a lot of time about um, colleagues taking care of African-American patients. You know, they're, they, don't, they just don't trust what I say. Um, but, you know, we came back with, well, you know, there's reason to not trust. And, uh, and Dr. Essie and uh, you said on NPR uh, maybe one or two weeks ago that their primary issue, one of the primary issues in the black community when it comes to medical care is trust. Because that trust has been breached many times over and over in our history. And, and to um, appropriately address that, you have to make sure that um, people's concerns are addressed. Uh, so we talk about, you know, what are the layers that ensure safety when a vaccine comes out? So any vaccine that becomes marketed in the United States has gone through a, at least a three-phase process. The first phase is where a small group of people receive the trial vaccine to just make sure that it's safe. And the second phase is a study that it's expanded to give access to vaccine um, with more people who have different characteristics so different ages, different levels of health, different chronic conditions. And then phase three is the, the largest phase where it's given to thousands and thousands of people to make sure that it works and that it's safe. And if it goes through that process and it gets marketed and it can be licensed and sold as a vaccine in the United States. Uh, so if the vaccine is available at that point, um, you can be assured that it's gone through a rigorous process with a lot of controls and patient safety um, implemented to make sure that it works for, for people. And as uh, Reggie said, it is important to try to get um, good representation across the country from different um, race, ethnicities, um, so that we can make sure that it does work for everyone. Um, I just want to lean in and just... Um say a couple of things. One is, um, I really understand, um, as Dr. Hilton said before, the mistrust that our community has with the, the medical um, field. And I understand why, but I do want to encourage people. One, um, when it comes to uh, medical knowledge, please uh, feel free to look it up and ask your healthcare providers about it. And when we think about resources, please search resources that are validated and that um and those resources usually typically on the internet everybody has access to the internet they have cell phones please um go to uh websites such as dot that end in dot gov dot org um so that the information that you know has been vetted about whether it's vaccine availability or um, things like that. The second thing is, is as Dr. Bell said, is building the community building uh, trust uh, with the med medical professions. And I will pl plug this. This is one reason why diversity in medicine matters. So that people can see our faces and so that they feel comfortable enough to ask us the questions that they need to know to feel comfortable to receive the care that is appropriate um, for them. Um, some people don't feel comfortable um, 
speaking with their healthcare providers. And I'm a big proponent of this. You need to find someone that you do feel comfortable with. And I don't care what color, um, background, nationality that they are. And if it happens to be a person of color and you're a person of color, then I understand that. If it happens to not be, some people prefer women, some people prefer men. Um, but make sure that you feel comfortable with your health care provider. And again, that's why I believe diversity is so important in medicine so that we can begin to heal those bonds. Um, I mean, those those um, that, you know, those those things that we have um, in our community where people are afraid to be involved with the health care system. And Dr. Mitchell, I think you said something very important, which is uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to do this webinar and I specifically wanted to do it uh, with black physicians is because, you know, when this thing first started, we would get a lot of people that said, um, well, people aren't taking it seriously or, you know, and then a lot of the black and brown communities, they're not serious. They're still hanging out. They're having cookouts. They're doing whatever. They're posting on social media that black people can't get it. Um, so I think that having access um, and speaking with someone that looks like you is very beneficial for a lot of people. So I wanted to uh, kind of put that on display for people to see people who actually look like them, giving them information in hopes that that would help them pay a little attention. Yeah, no, this is really great. Yeah. I was gonna say like there are 5% of physicians in the country are African-American. That is a way downstream solution to preventing the coronavirus. But like Dr. Mitchell said, that is a problem that we have in this country, and that is a solution that we can address um, both from the preventive standpoint when it gets to the point of vaccination to the um, having patients who are enrolled in the treatment trials, vaccine trials, etc. cetera. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that we address that problem. And just thinking about access, there are, um, like yourself, a policymaker, thinking and ensuring that um, our communities, especially in the South, where up to two thirds of Af African American people live have access to medical care, whether that's through insurance um, or having an actual doctor in place. And so whatever can be done by um, folks who are maybe listening to this, who are working in that field um, before individuals actually get to us and deal with their issues around trust also needs to be addressed. Okay. I think we've had a great discussion today and I don't want to hold you too long. We're already at about an hour and a half. And I was like, Let's see if we can get this done in an hour. <laughs> but <laughs> not with Dr. Hilton talking. <laughs> she gives me that eleventh hour heart. <laughs> if you are viewing online, and I know that there are some more questions. Um, I am going to grab those questions. I will send them in an email to our panelists. Um, I'll have them respond um, to that email, and then I will post those response responses on the uh, Facebook live stream directly to you. I'll reply directly to you with those answers. Um, so I just want to thank everyone for joining today. And in closing, I want to give each of you an opportunity to leave some closing words, any advice or anything you want to get across to the people before we head out. And uh, we'll start with Dr. Hilton. Oh, right. <laughs> um, so uh, I guess the main thing is, um, you know, black and brown people, we've always been a sense of community. We've always, um, there's nothing that's been put in our path that we hadn't had to overcome and we've managed to not only survive, but to, to thrive. And this is gonna be one of the things that really stretches us and makes us remember to come and lean back in, to say, look out for your neighbors, call people and ask them, how can I be of help? Um, making sure that every action that you do, you do it thinking, is this worth the life of somebody else? Pick your favorite relative. And if going to that store, if it wouldn't be worth not seeing that person wake up tomorrow, then don't go. Um, but yeah, but take it everything that serious just until we on the healthcare side of things can get our things in order to take as best care of you as possible. Great. Dr. Mitchell? Um, I just want to just spread the word that yes, please continue to practice um, social distancing at the moment. If you have symptoms, please uh, find your, your closest um, testing center. Um, and um, on a, on a non, on a human level, um, as Dr. 
um, Hilton said, check in on people. I mean, technology is great nowadays. Look at us now having access to the world via um, computer or video. Reach out to them via video and um, check on them, see how they're doing, because this is this is a stressful time. Um, for everyone here in America, um, specifically, of course, I have my heart for my ladies that are pregnant um, or just had babies. Um, check on them as as well. Um, and that's all I want to say. Wash your hands. <laughs> wash your hands. <laughs> Dr. Asian? Uh Yes. Wash your hands. Please <laughs> ask if you go outside. Please practice social distancing for the best of your ability. And I would just encourage our uh, members in our community to continue to share their stories. I try to listen, and I think many of us do, to the news every day. And it's the stories from the same individuals who are losing their jobs, who are having trouble homeschooling their kids. And a lot of um, very millennial and one percent conversations. But I'm not hearing the conversations around our communities because our communities are going through it. And they're the ones who are figuring out if their family members are sick. They're the ones who are trying to figure this, this thing out in a much harder way. And unfortunately, we're missing out on those stories. Obviously, we have um, patients that we care for and we can share those. But it's not the same as those who are coming from um, the emotions that are being felt but by your stories. Um, so as best as you can, whether it's on Facebook, on Instagram, on whatever um, media platform you, you are willing to or able to, please let us know how you're getting through this so that the world can see how it's affecting our communities in particular. Awesome. Dr. Bell? So I'll also say for the first, um, wash your hands. <laughs> important. 20 seconds, alcohol or soap-based solution. There are videos on how to wash your hands properly. Um, but what I really want to leave you all with is um, thinking ahead, coming out of this. Um, the coronavirus is going to be a guidepost and a turning point in human history uh, for the globe. There's going to be a before this and an after this. Uh, my son already is thinking about this as, you know, life before coronavirus and life after coronavirus. So this is going to be something that defines human history. We have the chance here to use the deficiencies that the virus is exposing in our healthcare system, um, our ability to respond, our ability to take care of vulnerable populations. Um, and that can either be the story of how we let that continue or it can be the story of how we changed it, how we use this moment to pull together, to unify and change what was ailing our system so that we can all be happy and healthy and, and live together. And my hope is that we can use this moment to all pull the same direction so that when another pandemic happens or another public health crisis, or even if it's just chronic disease that's affecting the community that is silent to everyone else outside of that community, that we said that we use this moment to improve our system and truly take care of each other. And I'm, I'm hopeful that we can do that, but it, it's going to require everyone's help to, uh, to elevate that conversation, keep it going, and make sure that we uh, hold our leaders accountable, make sure that we're transparent, and that we, uh, we take care of each other. Great. And Brother Swift. Yes, yes. Thank you. I, sh I share the same sentiments as everyone else on the call. Uh, but also what I want to leave with this is that I, I want people to be able to share their experiences as well. It's not just for their sake, but for us. We're listening. There's innovators like me and there's there's physician activists, you know, such as Dr. Hilton and Dr. Bell and, you know, many others on the call and everywhere else that are also listening. They're also watching. They're also are trying to be able to bridge the deficiencies that are on the healthcare continuum as we speak. You know, I'm coming in from an innovative you know perspective to really dive into the types of innovations that can be deployed for people like us. And, and then the continuum of care continues with the, you know, the healthcare providers. And as well as being the, um, the policy makers to have better access to care for everyone else. We are listening. You know, we, we need to have more information so we can help more people. And the, the way I'm doing that is being able to be open and honest and be able to kind of overcome what we are facing right now with COVID-19. And this is where it starts. That's great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for all of you joining today, taking time out of your busy schedule to be a panelist, taking time out of your busy schedule to listen in to our great speakers today. And, um, you know, I just want to put this out there, that all of our panelists today, this is, uh, we logged on to Zoom this morning. This was really their first interaction with me. 
um, <laughs> in this live setting. But, you know, I reached out to Dr. Hilton and she said, hey, great, I'll do this Zoom. And I have a group of, of other physicians and friends who will be willing to do it, too. And here's their contact information. And they did not hesitate. And I think that that is a huge deal. Um, I thank you for that because you did not have to do that. Um, so once again, you know, thank you for spending that time with me. If you have any other webinars or any public forums coming up, if you send me that information, I will gladly repost it and share because I'm sure you have tons of new fans uh, <laughs> after today. And it's great to have uh, access and to see uh, people that look like you sharing valuable information. So I thank you. Thank you to our viewers at home. And to everyone, please enjoy the rest of your weekend. Stay safe. Wash your hands. If you need to contact my office, again, my email address, dritley at jcnj.org. My aide is on the Facebook uh, stream. She made some comments. Kimberly, go to Jay. You can definitely uh, reach out to her as well. And uh, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Stay safe.